resumed. It's time for questions to the Minister for Social Development, and we will begin with 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Mrs. Sandra Overend. Mrs. Overend. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister detail what discussions he had with John McPeak before, during, and after his resignation as Chief Executive of the Housing Executive? Um, I've had no discussions with uh, Mr. McPeak in regard to that matter. Uh, Mr. McPeak is employed by the Housing Executive. And as the member would be well aware, the Housing Executive has its own board, its own chairman, and its own chief executive. Um, so, therefore, his resignation was tendered to his employers, i.e., the Housing Executive. Uh, I was made aware uh, of the fact that he was resigning, and uh, the matter rests there. Uh, the indication to me is that, uh, according to the chairman, he would be um, stepping down probably at the end of the financial year or possibly at the, end, the, the, the actual year, calendar year. Uh, that matter is somewhat unclear. I call Mrs Overend for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister detail whether his previous much vaunted figure of a supposed £18 million overspend, something which now looks decidedly inaccurate, and of which this House and the companies concerned may eventually be owed an apology over, played any role in any discussions that, you may, that the Minister may have had or any others may have had on your behalf with, with Mr McPeak prior to his resignation? Um, I find the supplementary question somewhat surprising, insofar as I've already said that there were no discussions uh, with Mr McPeak. So, uh, therefore, I think that the uh, supplementary uh, is somewhat irrelevant. I call Mr David Hilditch. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, uh, could you outline how the, the Help to Buy scheme announced by the Prime Minister at the weekend uh, will work and whether it will be available in Northern Ireland? Um, yes, indeed. The um, Help to Buy scheme that was announced by the Prime Minister um, next week, uh, the Help to Buy Mortgage Guarantee Scheme originally announced by the Chancellor in, in Budget 2013 will be available for applications. Uh, that scheme will operate right across the United Kingdom, and it will see the government and lenders guaranteeing up to 15 per cent of a property's value. It will allow potential buyers to purchase a home with a 5 per cent uh, deposit and the balance covered by a mortgage. Uh, there are several high street banks uh, that are, will be offering the new help to buy mortgages to customers. So far, RBS and uh, Lloyds have confirmed that they will participate. Uh, and the mortgages will range from 80 per cent to 95 per cent of the property's value. And there will be on a repayment basis. Borrowers will be subject to the usual affordability and income verification checks uh, normally conducted by lenders to ensure that they can afford the mortgage they are applying for. Call Mr Hilditch for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank the, the Minister for his answer. Uh, further to that, then, a, a number of commentators have suggested that the scheme could lead to a house price bubble. Uh, how will the government ensure this does not happen? Well, I think some of those concerns have been more directed towards the situation in London area and the southeast of England, uh, as opposed to the north of England or indeed to Northern Ireland. Uh, but overall, um, every September, the government and the Bank of England Financial Policy Committee will be reviewing the impact of the scheme and examining whether the fees or the price cap should be adjusted. So uh, at the United Kingdom level, there will be that safeguard to ensure that uh, you don't get a house price bubble. But I think that in the Northern Ireland situation, it would be very unlikely anyway. Call Mrs Brenda Hill. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for his assessment of the recent visit by the UN Special Rapporteur, Ms Rolnick? Well, the, the, the visit by the UN Special Rapporteur to the United Kingdom as a whole um, certainly generated a large amount of uh, newspaper coverage, uh, a large portion of which was extremely uncomplimentary towards Ms. Rolnick. Uh, I think it was the Daily Express described her as the Brazil nut, uh, and other newspapers followed in a similar line. Um, her Marxist pedigree seemed to uh, have influenced some of her, her comments. However, um, 
in regard to um, her visit to, to Northern Ireland, I think one of the things that uh, did strike me was uh, that uh, there was uh, a lot said afterwards in terms of detailed comment, but on the basis of a very short visit. And having seen her preliminary comments, uh, her final report will not appear until March next year. Uh, some of her views seem extremely ill-informed. I think someone coming from a country where you have tens of millions of people living in shanty towns is in a poor position uh, to comment on uh, the housing situation here in Northern Ireland. And, um, she might well have been better spending some time sorting out problems there where tens of millions of people in Brazil are living in appalling conditions. Call Mrs. Hale for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. And I, can the Minister confirm that Mr. Olnick's programme was organised in collaboration with the Practice and Partition of Rights Group and that she only visited one side of the social housing from the community? I thank the member for that supplementary because she does raise a very um, significant issue there. Um, the Practice and Participation of Rights Project, which is a lobby organisation, um, seems to have had a key role in organising her visit. And it was noticeable that in the course of the one day that she spent here, um, she actually spent longer with them than she did with officials in either uh, the Department for Social Development or indeed uh, with the housing executive. It was also significant that uh, during the course of, of that visit, uh, I think she spent uh, two and a half hours in the afternoon touring the New Lodge area, the Seven Towers and Sailor Town. Now, she was here to look at the whole of Northern Ireland and yet she devoted two and a half hours to one specific area. I was interested also to note that when I spoke to community organisations in unionist communities adjacent to that, none of them had either been informed about the visit by PPR, they would never been invited to any of the meetings, and she wasn't invited to their communities. I think it says a lot indeed about PPR and the operation that they carry out uh, in the fact that they excluded uh, unionist communities and only took her to a nationalist community. If we're dealing with housing issues, we need to deal with the whole community, unionist, nationalist and other. Everybody deserves a fair deal, but not in the eyes of some people. And if people are dealing with human rights issues, I thought that one of the human rights issues was the right to equality of treatment. That certainly doesn't seem to be the case in this instance. Call Ms. Megan Fearn for something. Um. Last thing, Corla. Um, given what the Minister has said today around the health to buy scheme and the, and the potential for a second housing, bu housing bubble, sorry, does the Minister plan to increase the number of social housing units to meet the demand? Well, welcome indeed. The, 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 the question, and she raises, uh, the member raises the question of um, increasing the, the amount of social housing. Um, it's a matter that is very near to my heart, and it's one that I've put a lot of effort into. Uh, but the problem that we face there is that the uh, people who are meant to be delivering social housing in Northern Ireland, and that is through the housing associations, um, they haven't really stepped up to the mark. Um, the, the number of housing associations, I've dealt with this recently in, the, in the, the Chamber, we have about 30 housing associations in Northern Ireland. You have only about half a dozen of them who are really building. Some of them don't build at all. In fact, many of them don't build at all. Uh, you have a small number building, and of those, an even smaller number who do the overwhelming majority of the new build. We need to have a situation where housing associations are really stepping up to the mark. I think they have a lot to learn from some of the housing associations in Great Britain, which are much more creative, much more imaginative, much more innovative. And if that were the case, I think we would be in a much better position in terms of delivery. It has been disappointing uh, to me, and in fact, I will be meeting with housing associations again in the not too distant future to press them. This. Met with them in the past and pressed them. Met with the housing executive as well and pressed them. Both the housing executive and the housing associations really need to be delivering more uh, if we are to attain or achieve the sort of targets that a member and myself would want to see uh, delivered. It is a sad situation when you have the money there to be spent. You're not able to spend it. And in fact, quite often at the end of the year, there's a rush to buy off the shelf to make up numbers. That's not a good way of doing it. It's not a planned way. It's not the proper way to do it. It's the best way in the circumstances. But really, the problem is need to, needs to be tackled at its heart. Get the housing associations really building. 
Ms. Fearn for a supplementary. I would ask King Corley to thank the Minister for his answer. And given what he's just said, and with a waiting list of approximately 40,000 people, does he think that enough social housing has been built? And what key actions can we take forward to see results quickly? Well, in a sense, um, the, the answer I gave to the first question, in many ways, has dealt with part of the second. I would say this there are 40,000 people on the waiting list, but I could own a house in Coltra worth a million pounds and still be on the waiting list. Yes, I do wish. <laughs> Not much chance of it. A person could be the owner of a house worth a million pounds or whatever a cultural and still put themselves down on the waiting list. Anybody can put themselves down. You could be there with no points. You could be on the waiting list with no points and you're still on the waiting list. You're dealing with actually a smaller number than, than the number that has been mentioned there in terms of real need. And that's why, of course, we deal with the issue of stress, people who are over 30 points rather than people who are possibly sitting there with no points or um, already homeowners. A person can be a homeowner in any situation and still put themselves onto the waiting list. So the, the, the figures that are often quoted can be somewhat misleading. But the real challenge here is that we get a situation where housing associations are facing up to the challenge uh, and are really delivering. We have a higher level of uh, housing association grant in Northern Ireland than in GB. Housing associations here are in a privileged position because of that, so we really need to see more delivery. And um, I had a, a very useful visit across to uh, Liverpool and Manchester not so long ago to see some of the work being done by housing associations there, not just in terms of their new build, but also some of their other initiatives, which were very imaginative. I would like to see more of that here. Call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. As the Minister responsible for delivering 10 shared neighbourhood projects as part of the OFM DFM Building a United Community strategy, can the Minister update the House on what neighbourhoods have been identified where and a timescale for their delivery? Um, in terms of the uh, issue of shared um, communities, and that's an issue that uh, members of the, the Alliance Party uh, often seek to raise. Um, the, um, yes, indeed, absolutely. It's interesting, you know, I, I, I make the, the, the point often when this is raised. Segregation is not limited to social housing. There's as much segregation in private sector housing as there is in many areas in regard to social housing. And secondly, that um, social housing integration can only really take place where there is a desire and a willingness to do it. And in many places, that is not the case. For example, if someone is, um, if I come through the, the uh, West Link and I see a block of flats with the names of hunger strikers on it, and I see a block of flats with tricklers on the top of it, it's, it says to me, I don't think people from the US community are going to feel very comfortable there. So quite clearly, certain communities have made a choice. Now, the aim is to have more shared communities developed and supported during the next uh, number of years. Um, and, and that is being taken forward. But I have to say, if you actually look at the example, even filling Spring Farm in Antrim, it has been a challenge to actually fill up what was brought forward as a shared scheme. And some other schemes, I'm not so absolutely sure that there is the huge appetite, but sometimes it's put forward. Um, I'm happy to, to come back to the member with uh, more details on, on where we are. We've got 11 shared new bills schemes uh, that I have there, the details of, I can give the member details of those. As regards to moving forward, I'm happy to come back to the member with more details, but I would not be as um, Minister, confident you're well over your time. that it will necessarily be delivered at some times. I'm afraid, Mr. Imagine. Little, you will have to have a very quick supplementary. Well, the Minister says that he's not sure there's appetite for shared neighbourhoods. He seems to disagree with the First and Deputy First Minister then, given that their strategy sets out the need for 10 new shared neighbourhoods. So I would indeed be grateful for the information as to where they've been identified. What does the Minister think are, is a key feature of a shared neighbourhood scheme? Very quickly, Minister. Well, one of the key things I think might be actually getting people from both communities buying into it. And the point has been, and I point the member back again to Spring Farm, where 
Applications were, uh, invitations were sent out right across the province. It was a very, very slow process of getting people to buy into it. Now, there are some small schemes that have worked, and I'm aware of those, but they have tended to be very small, specialised in particular locations. We should be aspirational. It's right to be aspirational. And that's the point from the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. We should be aspirational. But the reality, I think, also needs to be very much kept in mind. And I remember, remind the member again, when we see in private Minister, sector your housing time the problem well up. of segregation, we shouldn't be surprised that it happens in social housing as well. Order. That ends the period for topical questions. We will now move on to oral questions.